Hey everyone, and welcome back to Suited Aces Poker, where every week we review hundreds of hands from poker vloggers across YouTube and bring you 10 of the best. This week, we've got excellent analysis. We've got question marks about queens, and we've got Phil Helmuth. Let's make a start. At number 10 this week, and Harry B is playing at the Seminole Casino in Coconut Creek, Florida, in a 2-5 game. And I think by now, you all know, I don't like running it twice. When did we even start running it twice? After folding for an hour, we see a button shuttle and we're in the small blind with a pretty good hand. We have Jack-10 suited and we happily open up the action to $35. We see a call from the player on the big blind and then action folds back around to the player on the button. The button now decides to put in a smaller raise. The button bumps it up to $110. This is my friend and we do have a lot of experience. I don't think he's getting out of line here, but even if it wasn't my friend, I just don't think he's ever doing this light. Considering I'm the first to act and I open up the action and then the second person to act just calls, I look pretty strong and he looks pretty strong himself. So the fact he's raising us means he definitely has a good hand, probably like aces, kings, queens, maybe some suit of broadways, hands of that nature. With that being said though, this is one of the few combos of hands that I think I'm okay flat calling with out of position multi-way. So that's what I do. I make the call and this does entice the big blind to tag along as well. So we're off to see a flop, which is king three deuce all clubs. Okay, this is a really good situation. Action starts off me and I don't see really any point in betting here. I decide to check it and it does check over to the button. The button now throws out $200. Okay. This is getting even better. We each start off the hand with around a thousand. I could definitely flat here, but if I had an overpair containing a club, just the naked ace of clubs, I'd probably be putting in a raise right now. Considering he bet into two people and a pretty large sizing, I think he does have an overpair here. Hopefully aces are kings. So if I jam, I think we might be able to level hands of that nature into a call. So that is what I decided to do. I just decided to go all in right now. And what in the world? The big blind doesn't think for too long and makes the call for around the same amount. Okay, was not expecting that. I think he probably has a set here, which we are beating considering the line taken preflop. So action's on the button and he looks pretty uncomfortable and like agonizing. And he does flash his cards, which is aces. And he does decide to throw them in the muck, which is probably rightfully so, just considering all the action beforehand. So now we're off to see a flop and we both expose our hands. He does have pocket threes, which is good for a set. And we do decide to run out two boards. Praying that the board doesn't pair. The four diamonds followed by the seven of diamonds is perfect. So now we just need to fade some pairing cards on the bottom board. But unfortunately, <laughs> the turn is immediately a three giving him quads. So we are not going to be winning that one. But we do decide to chop the button's money. So can't complain with a win, but... I wish I would have scooped, obviously. Number nine this week, and Jamin Burton is playing at the Rounders Club in San Antonio, Texas in a $300 No Limit Hold'em tournament. And it is always better to listen to your gut. We pick up action at level two of this tournament as nothing really happened in level one. Then again, nothing of real merit ever really happens in these early levels, unless you bust. Blinds at 100, 200, and antes haven't even kicked in yet. Early position opens to 600, and the hijack calls. I slide in there as well with queen jack offsuit, and the big blind comes along. Four of us see a flop of jack, four, seven, rainbow. The big blind checks, and the opener continues with a bet of $1,200 or about half pot. Hijack comes along, which honestly doesn't surprise me. If there's one thing I've picked up on here in Texas, is that people don't really like folding at all. With top pair and decent kicker, I come along as well. The big blind isn't a quitter. He's in there too. Still four ways and we see a queen of clubs turn. It improves me to two pairs, so great card for me. The big blind checks again and now the opener drops in the overbet. 8,000. The hijack quickly folds and with two pair, raise or call or both in play. This early in the tournament with the guy still behind me, I settle on calling and the big blind folds. We start this tournament with 40,000 chips, and this pot is already over 23k. The river pairs the four, which could be a problem, as his overpairs have now leapfrogged my two pair. He bets 15,000. I tank for a while on this one. Ooh, let me think about this one. 
I take a glance at the villain here and he just doesn't look comfortable. He's giving me please just go away vibes. So I call. He says, you're good and exposes his hand. I thought I saw 610 offsuit, but wasn't sure. So I asked my neighbor and he confirmed. What do you show? 610. 610. 610 offsuit. Oh, I see. This is going to be one of those type days. Number eight this week, and Alex Duval is playing in a 2-5 game at the Win in Vegas. And we're asking you, is there any better way to play trips on the flop? Let us know in the comments. In the next hand, I have pocket tens, and there is an under the gun limp for $5. We raise to $30 on the hijack. Middle position calls, and the limper also calls. The flop comes, jack, 10, 6. All clubs. Really not a fan of the clubs, but obviously that is not going to stop us from betting when action checks to us. I bet small, $30, and middle position folds, and the limper ends up raising to $80. We could be beat here by a flush. I'm not going to do anything, but just make the call here. The turn comes the ace of hearts. With about $250 in the pot, this is not slowing my opponent down, who bets 125. Once again, don't think there's much to do here, but just make the call and really hope for a board pairing card. This does not happen as the river comes the king of spades. My opponent slowly counts out a small stack of green chips, which ends up being 375. This is a big bet and my opponent has about $500 left behind. At this point, not only does a flush beat us, but also a queen as that makes a straight. I guess this person could be bluffing with something like ace x of clubs, having turned top pair and can continuing for value thinking they were good, but I really do not expect them to bet this river as a bluff, especially considering they were older. I mean, look at these hands. With great sadness and disbelief, I lay this hand down. I feel like they probably just had a flush here, but let me know in the comments what you guys think of this fold. Is it really out of line or is it good? Number seven this week, and we are back with Harry B in that 2-5 game at the Seminole in Coconut Creek. And if you've ever wondered how to play junk, this is definitely one of the craziest hands I've played in a while. Another gun opens to 20, the low jack calls, I call in the cutoff, and we see the blinds call as well. So we're going 50 ways to a flop with a hand that is really not that good, but we are in position. So once again, flatting 7-4 suited pre-flop is really not that ideal unless the flop comes jack 5-8 with two clubs. Wow, are you kidding me? We flop a flush draw and a gutter with one of the most garbage hands pre-flop, Checks in the big blind and he leads out for $40. Now the player in the low jack raises to $100, definitely a small raise. Now we're in a bit of an annoying spot, but our hand is too good to fold. We have way too much equity. I just decide to make the call in position and this does entice the big blind to call as well after the small blind folds. So going three ways to turn, praying for a club or a six and we get a freaking six. Single best card in the deck. The big blind checks to the player in the low jack and it's like music to my ears. He goes all in for a massive overbet. I pretty quickly call and the big blind snap folds. And to my surprise, he has eight six of clubs. Wow, we were in miserable shape on the flop, but now we have to fade a club, an eight or a six. Can we hold? The first river is a jack of hearts, so we're gonna be getting half the pot. And the second river is a five of hearts. What in the world just happened? That is single-handedly one of the most crazy hands I played in a while. What looked like a great flop actually only left us with four clean outs. So even though we won this hand, this should be a lesson to avoid hands such as this pre-flop because you can be left in miserable spots such as this one. If I wouldn't have hit a six, it would have been pretty costly for me. In my defense though, they were vlog watchers and I just wanted to try to beat him with a garbage hand. He took the bad beat exceptionally well and once again, I'm sorry, man. That was definitely a pretty sick one. At number six, and Yale Greenfield, the live king, is playing in a 5-10 game at the Hollywood Park Casino in Inglewood, California. And there's nothing like getting called all in when you're holding cowboys. Last hand of the night here, and it's a doozy. Pocket kings on the button. So we've had pocket aces two times, and now pocket kings two times. That's when you know you're running hot pre-flop in a session. However, we're barely winning anything to this point. We open to $60. 
The small blind professional makes it 300. This has the makings of a button versus small blind war. And when I say that, I mean that she knows that I'm gonna open the button relatively wide, and I know therefore she's got to play back at me relatively wide. So it's a I know that she knows that I know spot, but of course we've got pocket kings here. 800. So I four bet for value and make it 800 to go. And she five bets. I watch the dealer and she tells me it's 1800 to go. So I gotta count exactly how much I have. Oh. And I six bet shove for 2950 effective and she snap calls us. Okay. So we're gonna go two times here and you feel a little bit sick, like maybe she could have aces, but it's button versus small blind and it just is what it is. First board comes with a jack. Second board looks safe, but the river's a queen. And she mucks, so she didn't have pocket queens here. She probably had something like ace-king, ace-king suited, and we win an awesome 6K pot with pocket kings. And this is gonna be the majority of the profit that I make for the day. Number five this week, and Kyle Fischel is playing in Orange City, Florida at the Orange City Racing and Car Club. He's in a 2-5 game, and, well, that was a surprise. It folds to me in middle position. I have ace-queen of clubs. I decide to raise to $25. Well, the cutoff three bets to 50, and then it folds back to me. My hand is definitely strong enough for a four bet, both based on how action this table has been, also how deep this table had been playing. However, this opponent had min three bet pre-flop like maybe two laps ago, and that time he had exactly pocket kings. So I'm not really sure he's super balanced with his three bets, but either way, my hand is definitely too strong to fold, so I make the call. When the flop is king, queen, jack with two spades, I'd say it's a decent board for me. I check, my opponent bets $75. I think middle pair and gut shot to the nuts is still just too strong to fold. I do think sometimes I'm just up against ace king here, but I do think my opponent will not give up right now if he had like tens or nines or something like that. Even a hand like ace jack could play the exact same way. So on this flop, I make the call. Turn four of clubs, not really what we're looking for. Probably just gonna give it up if we're faced with another large bet. But this time my opponent only bets $75. So now it's 75 to win 275. I'm getting over 3.5 to one on my money. I believe my queen is live. I do think at this point my opponent's kind of narrowed himself to ace king or ace jack. I'm beating one hand, losing to another. A 10 that's not of spades definitely gives me the nuts, but likely a chopped pot. Either way, getting such a good price, I just simply can't help myself. Couldn't resist, mate. I throw the 75 in there. And the river is the queen of diamonds. I actually considered leading at this card because I think my opponent has ace king a lot of the time, but he'd been giving a great deal of action, so I actually expect him to just jam when check to and to which i'll snap call as he only has like 350 dollars behind but when i check he only bets 100 i suppose i could jam over the top of that bet but i do think a hand even as strong as like pocket aces may just let this one go given the run out and my jam is just a queen 100 percent of the time well regardless i'm sure i made many mistakes across the playing of this hand i choose to just call this one and my opponent had pocket kings I'm pr so i'm pretty happy he didn't bet more on the river because uh, he, he would have got me number four this week and close to broke is playing at the gardens casino in hawaiian gardens california in a 10 20 cash game and does somebody need to call the floor what is up with those queens middle position decides to raise to 50 dollars it folds over to me here in the big blind, I look down at king-queen offsuit. There is a straddle on. For this small sizing, I'm going to go ahead and defend my king-queen offsuit. Although, it's a fine situation to 3-bet at certain frequencies. At this point, I'm just going to make the call, play flops. It's unfortunate that I'm out of position, but it's a little easier when the straddle decides to make the fold. We're off to a flop that comes ace-6-4 with two spades and a club. I am holding the back door in a flush draw, which is good in some aspects, of course. I check it over to my opponent, and he decides to bet $50. He's probably going to be betting his entire range on this board texture, so I don't mind making the call for the one time here. Looking to improve on a turn, and it does come something interesting as it comes a queen. 
when I check it over to my opponent. He decides to bid $200, and for that price, I am considering getting away from it. But at this point, I've turned equity, so I'm going to make the call and play some rivers. The river comes a deuce. And as you guys know, a deuce has never changed anything anywhere. I check it over to my opponent for a third time. And for a third time, my opponent unloads the clip, betting $500 on this river. Again, at this point, a lot is going through my mind. I'm just wondering what specific hands my opponent can have that can go three barrels. I think specifically Ace-Queen and Ace-King are the only hands that can do it credibly. Maybe if he's a sicko and learning from the book of Mariano, he's sick enough to go with the hand as weak as a top pair with a weak kicker. But in reality, I just don't see a ton of merit in that in this spot. So after a little bit of tanking, I end up putting the hero's cape on. We feel I feel like I have to do it at least once a session. I make the call, and my opponent shows King Jack offsuit for the three-barrel bluff. Picked up some equity there on the turn. Outstanding bluff on his end. It's unfortunate that he just ran into the station of the table. Happy to take down a pot and build off of that. I will. Finally getting something going in my direction. Picking off a massive bluff there. I feel like a hero that we all needed. Number three this week, and Branson is playing at the Hustler in California in a 5-5 cash game. And I'm not sure that Phil Helmuth was even at this table. Now I get 8-9 of clubs in the small blind. The theme of the day is limping. There are four limpers this time, and I open to $45. The plus one player is the only one to make the call. The flop comes king 7-8 with two diamonds. Same as last hand, I should have all the strong kings in my hand, while he shouldn't and I bet $40. He makes the call. The turn is the four of spades. I continue betting $125 with second pair and the range advantage, and he calls again. The board has two flush draws, and it's rather wet, so when he just calls, I don't think he'll have any two pairs or sets very often. I'm thinking he has either a weak king, diamonds, or maybe spades with a seven or eight. The river comes the queen of spades, completing the backdoor flush draw, and I check. Hoping he checks back, but he bets $200. To me, this bet seems pretty weird. A weak king or mid pair would probably just check back at this point, and I feel like a flush would go for a bigger sizing. Still, this bet seems pretty value-y, so I'm racking my head, and then it hits me. We're at Phil Helmuth's meetup game. A few days after Phil pulls one of the sickest moves of his career. Oh my! Oh, oh, oh my! No! He makes the call with the queen four! Two river, two pair? You can pick one, bro. I flip over the queen of diamonds and it confirms it. I think this guy is queen four. I fold, and he shows queen four. Let me tell you this, guys. It does not feel good losing to queen four. The queen four! What am I? What, what is happening? At two, close to brokers playing at the bike in Bell Gardens, California, in a 10-20 cash game. And as Kieran says himself, this has to be the call of the night. So by this juncture in the game, I'm probably stuck 13 or 14,000, which is a lot. It, it just is. We cannot, it's, it's hard to pretend like it's not. But considering this is the biggest stakes I've ever played, uh, I feel like I'm, I was more nervous to start the session off. And now that I've, you know, dusted off quite a bit, I'm kind of like just okay with it. Like it kind of just is what it is. As we find ourselves in another spot, the cutoff decides to raise to $120. It folds over to me in the big blind, and I decide to make the call with King Jack offsuit. Probably works better as a three bet sometimes at some certain frequencies, but at the end of the day, I don't mind just calling. 
The straddle makes a fold. We're going heads up to a flop that comes pretty great. Jack 9-3 with two spades. A very dynamic board texture. Ton of straight draws. Ton of flush draws out there. My opponent's going to have like an infinite amount of those combinations from the cutoff. I check it over to him and he decides to bet $210. This is one of the action players I was telling you about earlier. One of the fun players of the group. The one that I lost the, the, that massive pot with ace-queen against. But uh, he's super fun to play against and he's very aggressive to make. He makes me think a lot and you'll see in this hand. We're going off to a turn card that comes the five of clubs. I check it over to my opponent and he decides to bomb this turn car for $860. Really massive sizing and it would be really nitty of me to make the fold. The funny thing is that you can probably hear in the audio just a tad bit. He's saying that he wants to get me to fold all of my flush draws. And uh, I, I don't have a flush draw, sir. I do have pretty much the top of my range here. So I end up making the call. We're going off to a river that comes literally, and I'm not exaggerating, the worst card that could have possibly peeled off. That is the Queen of Spades. Every single draw that exists on the planet Earth has come in. Straight draws, flush draws, you name it, it got there. Even a hand like Queen 10, a straight draw that didn't get there now beats me as it makes top pair. The interesting thing is that when I check it over to him, he decides to bet for $1,700. Why I think that's interesting is that pretty much eliminates all single pair holdings in my opinion. This is a very dynamic board texture and it would be really weird for my opponent to be going for value with anything really less than top two pair it feels like. Besides that, I feel like it had to be a straight or a flush. And for me, that's relatively polar. One thing of note that I think is very important is that I am holding the king of spades. So I do block some of his made flush combinations. I end up going to the tank for what is actually probably the longest tank I've ever had in my poker vlog career. I end up tanking what feels like over three minutes. A lot is going through my mind, like I told you, against specifically this player. He is super aggressive and puts you in so many tough spots that there is an opportunity that he can, he can just have some air here, some random dust. That can be settling into the sky. I, it's really hard to tell. And he can obviously also turn ace, ten of spades or something, you know, the nuts against me. It, he just has that potential. And if that's the case, you know, I'm not scared money. I came here with the understanding that I'm going to have to make some big calls and I'm going to have to make some big folds. So this is a spot where I have to do one of the two. At this exact moment, I'm sitting with about $2,500 or $2,700 in my stack right now, somewhere in the realm. And this would be for most of it. If I make the call and I'm wrong, I'm left with pennies. After enough of pause, I end up making what is the biggest call, I think, of my poker career. My opponent tells me. Would you believe that I never saw my cards? No, he don't have I, I, never, I never saw them. I don't know what I have. No way. No, yeah, I, I never saw them. This is Jack. I never saw them. Yeah. Ah. Whoa, what a call. Yeah. At this point, I'm thinking, what the hell is going on? He flips over the deuce first, followed by a seven. Seven deuce offsuit. Jeez Louise. I show down my King Jack for an unbelievably great bluff on his end, obviously using his range advantage there. Picking off a bluff, which was probably a pretty bad call, but I just use a couple of live tells to help me get to that decision. And we're just going to have to live with it. And obviously, you can't complain when you bink a massive pot like that. And our number one for week 14, April 2022. Congratulations to Ashley Sleaf playing in a $230 tournament at the win in Vegas. And we loved this hand, not for the poker, but for the analysis. Only a few hands after that, we looked down at the beautiful Jack Ten of Spades, flicking the open to 1600, and just the big blind comes along. The flop is ace seven deuce rainbow with one spade. The driest of dry flops. I have a backdoor flush draw. I have the range advantage by opening early position against the big blinds call. He's got all kinds of hands. So obviously I'm gonna see bet. So I bet 1200. My friend in the big blind has been commenting on some hands that I've played, maybe noting some of that aggression that I was talking about earlier. And he just looks like he wants to go after it. Like sometimes you could just look at someone and tell that they have devious thoughts going through their head and he follows through, he raises, he check raises the flop to 3,500. You know what? I don't believe him. I'm just looking at his face. I'm looking at this board texture. I think that yes, he could have ace deuce. He could have ace seven, but a lot of people don't peel seven deuce from the big blind, even the suited variety. A lot of people even slow play a set on this board. 
That's not always true, but I have to keep that in mind that he's repping a really, really narrow range of hands to be confidently raising this flop. He knows I'm gonna be c-betting at 100%. He knows that I bet small and he can get away with one by raising. So with all that being said, I decided to peel one off and see what he does on the turn. I'm really gonna force him to go after it if he wants to win this pot. The turn is the six of spades. So things are getting interesting. We turn a flush draw. That's one of the cards we're probably gonna be continuing on, depending on what happens. In this case, he bets 6,100, so he's not slowing down. It's a pretty good price, and I know I can most likely get all of his chips if I backdoor into a flush, and he actually has one of the strong hands that he's representing. So I call, and the river, is a three spades. We make a flush and we're hoping for him to stick his remaining 17,000 or so in the middle. Instead, he waves the white flag or what I think him waving the white flag and checks it. I put the rest in. He doesn't take too long. He snap folds and he claims he had queen three of hearts. <laughs> He, he, he didn't claim this right away. He claimed this later because it was a hand that really baffled him. He claimed that he figured that no matter what ace I had, he thought I would fold the turn, which I, that's never happening. I'm never folding an ace to his check raise on the flop and bet on the turn. He might put me in the blender by the river, but I'm never folding on the turn when I have an ace. And that's because honestly, you guys, I don't think a lot of people check raise ace 10 suited, ace jack suited. I don't think they raise enough top pairs with medium-ish kickers. So if that were the case, if I thought that he raised a lot of those hands, I can give him credit for actually having a lot more value. But in this case, I didn't really think he had it. We lucked out and got there, but honestly, if it was a brick I, and he checked it to me, I would have ripped it because of all the reasons I stated before. I was really gonna go after this pot no matter what happened. Happy that it worked out the way it did. We were feeling feisty and it worked out. Fantastic analysis, Ashley. We really enjoyed that hand. Don't forget to look in the description box for links to all of the original content, including more hands from Ashley's tournament at the win. So that's it for this week, folks. Thank you for watching. Let us know what you think in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll look forward to seeing you again next week, where we'll have more 10 of the best. Until then, good luck of the felt.